Okay, great, thank you. I guess we should have brought food. Um, seems like everybody's grabbing their sandwiches and, and lunch right now. But, um, but welcome, thanks for joining us. Um, and so um, we'll just jump right into the first slide of our presentation here. We, we don't have a clicker. I'll just do the space bar. Okay. Um, one thing to say, um, we have this session going on now. Directly after this, there is, um, there's, a, there's also the open mic area. Um, and so if we want to have continued discussions, talk about some of the topics um, that we're going to bring up during this session, um, OWASP was kind enough to slot us in for the open mic session right after this. So if you want to follow us across the hall, we'll be over there right after this talk. So a little bit about who I am, and then Josh will introduce himself. Um, I'm a director at KPMG in information protection. Um, a little bit, my focus is advanced threat defense, penetration testing, um, security research, those types of, um, types, type of topics. Um, and then a little bit, you know, my recent history, um, I also founded a conference called ThoughtCon in Chicago. Um, and that goes on um, every April, and there are fifth ones um, coming up next year. And I also ran Spider Labs, um, the Trustway Spider Labs team, for about a decade or so, um, up until just about a month and a half ago. Um, I'm Joshua Corman. I, my day job is Director of Security Intelligence for Akamai. Um, at least for this type of talk, um, I'm really not speaking as an employee, but more as a father, a citizen, a husband, et cetera. And that's pretty much who we're talking to for each of you in the audience as well. Um, my primary research tends to focus on new adversaries and motivational structures and strategies for dealing with them. Um, I'm also working with people like Gene Kim and others to find security injection points in DevOps, which is very OWASP AppSec friendly, and more recently been putting a lot more research into security for the Internet of Things and consumer electronics, medical devices, cars, which is a lot of what the cavalry has to do. Um, that's good for now. So the general flow is uh, why are we here, um, what we've done to date, where we're going, and how we would like to work with you. Uh, that's in general the flow. So chapter one. So <laughs> why are we here? So um, you know, different people who have been drawn to the cavalry have come for different reasons. But at least for me, I've been asking the question for many years, are we getting better as a profession, as an industry? And there's many different indicators, and it's a moving target. But essentially, after searching high and low and talking to everyone I could in the government, in the defense, in the DHS, in critical infrastructure, I kept looking for the adults in the room. And I kept not finding them. And after getting as high and deep in the intelligence community as you can get and realizing that their missions distract them from things that were concerning to us, um, the nice thing about hitting rock bottom when you're sick and tired of being sick and tired is that you are open to taking your own fate into your own hands and some uncomfortable experimentation. So there's beauty and liberation in hitting rock bottom. So Nick and I were brought together for similar reasons um, on our own journeys. So, um, so a little bit about my journey and sort of how Josh and I sort of came together, even you know, thinking about these types of topics. Um, I've always been the type of person who has always thought about the future, thought about how things are going to be, how things could be, um, you know, and, and thinking about the way we'll interact with technology. And, and even from if you roll back the clock to like 1980s, and most of us would say, how do we project and think about what the year 2014 was going to be like? Um, it's probably very different than what we see today. It's probably much darker, actually. I mean, when you think of the futuristic movies that were taking place in the 80s, they always pictured, um, you, know, you know, flying cars and everything's clean. Everybody's wearing, you know, nice clothes and it's clean streets and everybody's healthy. But um, the, the real reality is it's, it's a bit darker. And so um, a couple of weeks actually before DEF CON, I decided to go on, a, um, go on a, something called a juice cleanse. Um, if, if anybody's here has ever done a juice cleanse, um, you, take, you drink juices for about six days, and you go you, and you basically just you know, it's breakfast, lunch, dinner, and snacks. It's just juice, and it sort of cleanses all the toxins out of your body. Well, one of the side effects of doing that, you end up having rather vivid dreams, or at least it was for me. Um, and so, you know, typically dreams have to have to do with things that you see in your everyday life, even subconscious things you interact with, or even thoughts you're having. And um, some of the dreams I was having were, were actually very, in, very much in line with some of the things that Josh and I were talking about. Um, one of the dreams I had, um, basically, I was sitting on this bus, and you know, a bunch of people, people I recognized were on this bus, were heading someplace, and started asking questions, you know, where are we going, you know, why are we here? And it basically, you know, it turned out that um, I was on a bus with people who were going to register for basically federal um, software development licenses. Um, and people were saying, well, you know, you have to fill out this form, otherwise you cannot code. You have to be a, so a certified software developer, or you can't have a job, and, and you can't be a developer. I thought that was pretty interesting. Um, another dream that I had, you know, I travel quite often, and every 
every time I walk out of a hotel room, there's always a, 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 a newspaper, USA Today, New York Times, or something sitting in front of the door. And I remember one of the dreams I had, I walked out of my hotel room and I glanced down and there was an article that said, um, you know, man arrested for hacker tools. And if you, I flipped through the pages and there was a, a Metasploit logo and it mentioned Nmap and it talked about how there was this person out there that was in possession of hacker tools was now being put in jail. Now that's not the present. It, is it in the near future that something like that could happen? Possibly. And then finally I had a dream where I was walking down the street in Chicago and going to visit some friends and um, basically walked down this dark sort of dusk type alley, knocked on a door and they let me in and it turned out I was walking into basically a hacker space. You know, people I knew were in the room and we were all sitting down talking and someone said, hey, we're going to get started in a few hours or a few minutes. Um, you know, take a seat and you know, look around. And the next thing I knew, you know, the lights went off, there was a knock on the door and people came in and started basically handcuffing people who were in that room and, and taking them off. And so they're basically re arresting people, not because of what they were doing, but because of who they were and because they happen to belong to this hacker space. And so that's where my journey came about in, in, in talking to Josh and trying to get in front of some of the problems that we're going to identify um, in, in this talk. Yeah, when we launched this at DEF CON, there was a palpable and heavy concern over the criminalization of research. You saw the heavy prosecution of Aaron Schwartz. Um, through his uh, eventual suicide, you saw the, the, the Weave case or Andrew Ottenheimer being pr prosecuted, and even though there are debatable merits to that case, um, the case law that comes out of that is highly problematic for even basic security research. And then his dreams sound a little bit far-fetched at times. It convinces me I never want to do a, ju a juice cleanse. But uh, <laughs> we, we definitely see evidence of this. Nmap and other hacking tools have been outlawed in France, in Germany, in uh, Brazil, and what you're having is uninformed policymakers are making knee-jerk reactions when something bad happens. And I, could, and I could see a future where those types of things can happen, you know, things I was experienced in my dreams, um, but and the reason why we're here and the reason we're talking is that we think there's a different way. We think we can get in front of these problems and get in front of this. Now, this wasn't my original impetus, but I decided to talk about it instead because it's part of my TED talk, but um, I went shark diving with Dave Litchfield right before DEF CON. And, you know, my boss told me what kind of an idiot gets in the water with an apex predator. Like, we tried to get him to come, too. And, you know, I like sharks. I'm a diver. So I wanted to do it anyhow. The risk-reward was okay. You know, when there was one shark, it was okay. Two, three, four, five starts getting overwhelming. We had blood in the water. They were very aggressive. They're nipping at us. Dave took that picture from outside the cage. And when I got back to my car, I was so happy to get back to dry land. And I realized, you know, my car operating system booted up. The Bluetooth connected to my phone. It fetched album and artist info off over the internet. And I said, you know, what kind of an idiot gets in the water with an apex predator? And, you know, it wasn't the first time it dawned on me, but essentially, we, you know, we're facing a different kind of ocean with a different kind of apex predator. And our dependence on IT and software is growing faster than our ability to detect it, uh, protect it. So if you think about this as a tsunami of the Internet of Things, we have software in our cars, in our medical devices, in our public transit. Um, look at all the debates yesterday with uh, Dave Kennedy testifying for healthcare.gov. We're just kind of becoming more and more and more entangled with insecure and defensible software and technology. And we haven't yet grokked that a lot of these things affect public safety and civil liberties as we become more entangled and dependent. So at Vegas, we said basically this was the please don't tase us, bro, uh, <laughs> stage where we wanted to say to the other researchers, look, the cavalry is not coming. No one is coming to save us. We have the domain expertise and the subject matter knowledge, and even though it should terrify us, we are the adults in the room. You know, congressmen and senators and judicial branch don't really understand fracking or stem cell research either. They need domain experts. So this was us saying it's time that we take a leadership role, and if they're not sitting in your, your chair to your left or to your right, they're really not going to have the knowledge to help. And we didn't know what the reaction was going to be, especially at, the, at, a, at a conference like DEF CON. You know, we got slated, um, we had submitted the talk, and then we got slated at 10 a.m. on Sunday, <laughs> which is a great slot to have in Vegas. And, and, um, and Josh and I, we, we, we even backstage sort of talking about this, well, there's probably going to be like 10 people maybe that are going to show up. And it turned out there was a rather full room, and this was track one at DEF CON. Yeah. Um, and instead of people, you know, throwing stuff at us and yelling at us and, 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 and fighting with us the entire time, and we, we start out saying we want to have a discussion about this, it was, you know, person after person was going to the microphone saying how much they supported the idea of, of, of forming something like we're doing. You know, really quickly, because we want to get to the newer material, um, the, this was recorded. So the, the B-Sides Las Vegas talk was the friendlier audience. The next day was the DEF CON keynote, uh, or two days later was the DEF CON keynote. 
on Sunday morning, but it, uh, in general, the way we frame it is we feel threats to our body, our mind, and our soul. So body loosely was public safety, public good. So could we do security research that saves human lives? Uh, the mind was really focused on concerns over the criminalization of research, and soul was really concerns over civil liberties, surveillance state, SOPA, PIPA, CISPA, ACTA, the UN takeover, the internet, a lot of stuff that I, I fell into as I researched Anonymous for the last three years. Um, clearly, DEF CON really cared about the criminalization of research. But, um, you know, one of the things I've been saying in my keynotes for the last couple of years is, if you think about what we do in our day jobs, our hobby became our profession when we weren't paying attention. A lot of you guys did this first for fun. Uh, this actually was fun a long time ago, guys. Um, but then our profession, when we weren't looking, now, now our trade and our security issues permeate every aspect of our lives, our kids' lives, everything. Think about how dependent you are on these things. And what I've noticed is when I look at the security industry, most of our research is on the most replaceable assets, like credit card numbers, thanks to things like PCI DSS, or you know, maybe a corporate asset. But it's at the neglect and opportunity cost of more irreplaceable uh, things like human life, trade secrets, intellectual property. So things fit on that continuum. And what scared me as an experiment is, you know, this is part of my Carnegie Mellon grad course that I teach, but essentially this is like the order of operations. The stuff at the bottom is the stuff that really helps you defend something. And the stuff at the top is the empty calories, like, you know, anti-foo for the foo threat. And there's relative gains here. And when I did a heat map of RSA, and then I did the same thing for Black Hat, almost all the talks are on your most replaceable asset type on the least effective countermeasures. It's like there's very, very large clusters there, and there's only a few people breaking away the pack, from the pack to things like insulin pumps or medical devices or car hacking. So we're not really well distributed to things that actually affect our personal lives yet. And that should, should bother you. So you know, a lot of what um, we're describing here and we're trying to you know, draw your mind towards is sort of this idea of a, of a funnel. And we have a couple different funnel examples. Um, but if you look at... Um, this slide here, what it talks about which browser is more secure. Now, it's sort of a rhetorical question. I'm not really looking for someone to raise their hand. Um, but if you think about how many people are spending their time trying to find browser bugs and how many people are spending their time to try to find um, web application bugs, um, it's, it's much, much greater than some of these other technologies that probably have more impact to our lives and, and other people's lives. So same thing, which mobile, you know, which mobile is more secure? You know, is it Android versus, uh, you know, iPhone versus BlackBerry? I, mean, I, mean, I don't know, right? Um, I don't know if Stacy's here, but we, at Source Boston, we run the call for papers, and 65% of the submissions last year were for mobile malware. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I run the, the call for papers for, I can sort of compare that. Um, at ThoughtCon, I think, you know, it was probably like 25 talks got submitted on, on Android malware um, in the same year versus some of the other talks. Now, if you look at here now, so this is other technology, which car is more secure? Now, most people aren't talking about this. Obviously, Charlie Miller um, did some work this summer, but that was some of the first research that really became mainstream in raising people's awareness about, wow, your automobile. When Josh got into his car and hit the start button, it booted up. Um, it wasn't just turning the, you know, turning the crank and, 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 and igniting the in engine anymore. It's basically you're booting up that car, and it also, in many cars today, are coming out, they have, they're Internet-enabled. They're always on cars, and so that's going to impact as, w as well. And we move into the, into the medical devices. There's just a handful of people in our field um, that, are, that are focusing and looking at medical devices. You know, Jade Radcliffe, um, unfortunately the late, late Barnaby Jack was focused here as well. Billy um, Rios. And Billy Rios um, is focused here as well. But that's, that's it. There's not many people beyond that small group of, of folks. And these types of things are impacting, have the, have the ability, if there's security flaws, to impact most people in irreplaceable ways. Um, loss of life. And then, of course, we have this sort of new revolution of, of consumer products that, you know, which thing is more secure? And sort of in the slide here, I actually own some of these devices, and that's why I chose to put them on the screen. Um, in my own sort of consumer world, I have these things in my home, and, um, and you know, even myself, I'm not, you know, focused enough on in securing this type of technology. Um, that, those types of things are going to impact, you know, your friends, your family, your, your children, um, cars, medical devices, Internet of Things um, will could have irreplaceable um, consequences um, if, they, if they are compromised. Yeah, so the general thrust was, you know, we, we're clearly taking on these new forms of dependence, um, but, you know, while we're struggling to solve even SQL injection that we've known about for 13 years or so, when we're trying, you know, they're not even trying in a lot of these consumer protection technologies. There's not even a notion of an SDL. There's not even a concept 
of adversary resilience testing. So one has to assume that there's all sorts of exploitable vulnerabilities, and now the few people who have started testing them are finding them. So one, one note, um, Jay Radcliffe, who's done, we mentioned about medical research, he found flaws in his own insulin pump. He reported it to places that he knew to report the problem to, and the next version of the insulin pump came out um, a year and a half or so later, and it still had the exact same flaws that he identified and reported. Yeah. Um, so th there has been an excuse, for example, so we have a medical device track in the cavalry movement, and we're having lots of calls with people to map out who's had which successes and failures, and how can we map the space, much like you might map an iPhone operating system. So if you're gonna jailbreak, you need to know how the system works. So we're kind of mapping so we can jailbreak the chain of influence and get better results. So he was originally told, yes, there might be a way to hack this, but this is gonna save lives. We're gonna approve it, but we'll do it better next time. Well, that was three years ago, and they just re-approved the same exploitable remote for that particular device. So they're not actually even applying the knowledge forward, uh, which it might have been a, re a reasonable risk decision now, but they're not even trying to get better yet. So we have to fuzz that chain of influence. So what we realized is, you know, whether it was my work on national security or critical infrastructure, I got as high and deep as you can get. And they just don't know how to pivot their existing missions to these things that don't even have public awareness or recognition yet. So it was, I, I was stunningly disappointed by some of the responses I got from people that should know better and think better. It's not that they're derelict in doing their job, it's that they're responding to public pressure. And there isn't much education awareness on these things. So the cavalry isn't coming, so you're the cavalry. It's you or it's nobody. And we can't do it alone, and we're starting to figure that out. But what we're converging upon between the initial, that was basically the initial stuff, is that while we framed it as body, mind, and soul, what's getting the most traction, the general, you know, my neighbor doesn't care about us whining about the criminalization of research. They don't care. But they do care about issues of public safety, and they do care about increased censorship and surveillance. So we believe that what's getting the most traction is the body. It's saving lives through security research, or public safety and public good, which actually has the natural byproduct of, as these laws are changed, like the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, and other things being discussed, if we're demonstrating clear public good that no one else has provided, it'll be much easier for those laws to be nuanced in a way to protect white hat security researchers while criminalizing nefarious folks. But what we really realize is, let's do security that matters. Not just our day job, not aligning to the business, I mean, the enlightened security people say, let's align ourselves with the business. Who's the business when you're talking about a medical insulin pump that can kill you? Is it the patient? Is it the doctor? Is it Medtronic or the different medical device manufacturer? So part of this is getting outside of the notion that security is only our day jobs. That's step one. And step two is realizing that we have to get outside the echo chamber. You know, we wake up every day figuring out how to break things, and we're really good at poking holes in each other. But the, the outside world is part of the solution set. It's a public good, public safety, so it needs public solutions. And, and I would say this type of conference is more of a, of a hybrid outside the echo chamber. You know, there's probably people in this room that are software developers, application developers, web application developers, and then we also have security professionals mm -hmm. in this room as well. Um, and you know, a great example of getting outside the echo chamber is like Josh a few weeks ago spoke at, spoke at a TEDx event. And so the audience mix of a TEDx audience there, I think I was the only security person in the entire audience. He was one of three people on Twitter. <laughs> it's mostly a Facebook crowd, it turns out. But, <laughs> but, you know, this is what we're learning is that we thought originally we were going to drive more people to research cars and medical devices, right? Get critical mass and work together. And that's true. But as we're learning, it's like, you know, we're really bad at education awareness. We don't, we're not at their conferences. So part of this is don't speak at only security conferences. There's medical device conferences. There's an FTC conference yesterday. There's car conferences. So part of this is becoming and readying ourselves to be good ambassadors to bridge the gap. So to date, um, this is a bad timeline, but officially we revealed the name of I Am the Cavalry at DEF CON. One month later, or about, about a month and a half, we had a constitutional congress at DerbyCon. Uh, we're going to dive into a couple of those slides. We basically had a working room for two days uh, with people coming to the city just for that. Um, one month later, we tried LastCon, because I think that's a really good boundary-spanning event between developers and DevOps people, like not just security people. It's a really nice attitude and bridge uh, builder. Uh, then I did a, in, the, in November, I did my TEDx on security for the Internet of Things, and we are here. Our next stops are Blue Hat. Blue Hat, uh, which is the invite-only, you know, A-list researcher thing. We're going to have a, a working group with them to elicit their ideas and responses on how to do this followed by ShmooCon, which we're working out how long with Heidi Potter. 
followed by possibly RSA. So um, we're trying to get to as many communities as possible as we funnel down from the art of, the, the funnel behind here is essentially body, mind, and soul, and way too much scope. What we're doing is we're narrowing it down to something that's um, tenable, that resonates, that can, can be executed. Now, inversely, we're also growing our participation. So what started as a possibly dangerously bad idea with Nick and I, after DEF CON, we had many, many people join the, the projects and the work. After Derby, we had about 100 people in the room for two days. You know, we're slowly expanding the types of people, and at TEDx, I basically conscripted the broader tech community because they're much better at education awareness and, vi and visualiz visualization than we are. So, you know, what Josh just described, you can sort of see where these journeys have gone. So Josh and I, you know, we mentioned, Josh mentioned earlier, sort of the hobby became a profession, um, now it's impacting our lives. You know, I've been, been working with computers and technology since I, since I was six years old. Um, and basically grew up in the BBS world, the, the hacker community that was in Chicago during that time. And, um, and then it became my job, you know, my, my, my day job. But now, you know, we, both of us, through our conversations, have realized that a lot of what we're doing is now impacting or should be impacting, um, uh, could be impacting our, our personal lives. And that was just two people. That was just sort of bouncing ideas off each other. And as we sort of, you know, work through this, um, we're, we're growing participation. Yeah, and um, you know, we all got here for different reasons, but for me, it took my mother dying in January to make, basically have me emotionally shattered, and I started just saying, you know what, I'm going to stop filtering my beliefs. I am genuinely concerned about this security issue and that one and that one, and if someone makes fun of me, I don't care about it. And doing so, it turned out we were finding others. There were a lot of us that were concerned about X, Y, or Z, but we were so concerned about what the echo chamber might say, so we started getting critical mass. And now we have people who helped not only participate in the DerbyCon events, but lead different chunks in different projects and put quite a bit of their own time and money into these more altruistic endeavors. I mean, one of the things, you sort of see this progression, we are not, we have not completed all of this no. here, right? So you see at the bottom there are discovery, mission, goals, plans, and then we have execution, teaming with, you know, teaming with concerned citizens. We're not there yet. And the reason we're not there yet is that we want to have these conversations and decide um, and, and, and discuss Within, with this community, we do this at DerbyCon, we're going to do it at the next conference, discuss the various issues, and every single time we've been discussing things, we're learning more and more of ways that we should direct our attention. Yeah, so DerbyCon was uh, late September. Um, we thought maybe five people would show up, but we said no matter how many people show up, we're, we're going to take advantage of it. We thought they might come in and out. People came to the city for this, they stuck in the room, and we had a really productive two days. Um, there's a video of my solo talk. We did not record the Congress because we didn't want to, we wanted Chatham House rules essentially. And kudos to Dave Kennedy for being so willing to, to share his space. These were a couple of the subject matter experts. We had a law professor, interim attrition, that she was just named to the FTC as a special advisor for possibly cybersecurity issues. Picture a lawyer and a law professor who's been going to DEF CON for 11 years. So she was an incredibly nice resource to have for us to interrogate where the laws, where's case law going, where software liability stand. So she was fantastic. And then we had a really diverse set of people. I mean, some of you know Katie Mazuris, some of you know, you know Jay Radcliffe, but we had these very shy people like maybe Craig Smith, who's done quite a bit of car hacking on a project he calls Open Garages. Because when they first started hacking cars, they were driving through the garage door by accident when you hit the wrong button. So they created a safer way to test the CAN bus of these automobiles without actually putting people or, or property in harm's way. And we even had people like uh, the, the cold, dead heart of Space Rogue here in the front. Uh, he testified to Congress long time ago, told the, the general public the kind of things we're concerned about, and nothing's changed. And yet, he sees maybe now, with this kind of a push, there's maybe a chance to, to try again. Um, you know, maybe right idea, wrong timing. So he's helping us understand this, so we don't make the same sins in the past. What's the relationship with media perception, public policy perception, what worked and didn't work, so that we're not just, you know, reinventing the wheel? Yeah, I mean, if you think about, you know, even back when, you know, Space Rogue, when you were testifying, um, you know, what was on the internet back then? A lot less. <laughs> Computers, basically. Compared to today, I mean, today it's, it's everything is connected. Everything's internet enabled. And so the, the, the importance of this type of, um, type of movement is, is, is actually amplified. Yeah. So we didn't know how much we'd get through, but essentially if you're familiar with lean startups and different processes, we had a facilitated monitor, and Adam Brand, really professional. And he basically said, look, we're going to try to figure out our, our identity in these two days. So what we asked ourselves are what conditions do exist that we don't like, what are the causes of those conditions, and what can we do hypothetically to eliminate them. 
We had tons of whiteboard sticky paper all over the room for each of the topics. Most of our time was spent on medical device security, automotive security, legal implications, and media hearts and minds. Tons of time on media. And really what we realized is the bottleneck in most of these things was the one that Space Rogue led on media and hearts and minds. We've done such a poor job making these issues digestible, accessible, in plain speak. We, turn, we asked the people in the room, how many of you had professional media training? Three. So we had 100 people coming through there. Three had ever had media training. So if you look at what Dave Kennedy's been doing on the news lately and how he testified, he's doing a great job. Whereas our ambassadors before might have been Gregory Evans types, you know, uh, who the, the general public couldn't tell the difference between a charlatan and an expert. So we have to invest and ready ourselves to be able to translate what we know into the important and accessible topics that can actually get hearts and minds. Um, so what we found was that there was a lot more people doing things than we knew about. So we're, at a minimum, we're creating a namespace and a watering hole to at least aggregate disparate efforts. It turns out that the medical device researchers were all making different mistakes. So when they compared notes, they're starting to get better traction in figuring out how do you actually push around the FDA through DHS and then get your bone published. Um, and we found that there was a lot more agreement than differences. This is just for your reference. There's a several videos or podcasts or different ways to see what we've been saying. And we're trying to make sure that every single talk is new compared to the prior one because, because we're learning more along the journey. So, you know, where are we going? Obviously, this was a, a movement that was started, you know, just this past summer or extended even a little bit before that when Josh and I were planning this and submitted our talk. Um, but we've often been asked, you know, the question of, you know, what, what do we want to be? You know, what do we want to be? Do we want to be an association like the American Bar Association, the American Medical Association, the American... I guess American Hacker Association or Security Professional Association. You know, what do we want to be, um, you know, or what do we have to be? Mm -hmm. And it's sort of the big question. Do we have to be something? Or could we be a collective of concerned citizens who happen to be technically literate, literate uh, in order to get um, the message out um, to the right people so they understand the issues at, at large and then demand changes? Yeah, one of the things we have to clarify is this is not an American problem. Um, so some of the lingo we're using is just because we happen to be working within the confines or government structures, but we have lots of models which basically said, how do you influence the, the judicial branch, the legislative branch, and the, and the executive branch? Um, then we also talked about the media as the, the fourth branch of government. Um, part of this, though, is when you look at actual formal legal structures, is should we form a 501c3 educational and or a 501c6, which is a professional organization? And in talking with our law professor, who was giving us at least the lay of the land, she's not a member, but she's giving us information, she basically said, when the time comes to ask for expert testimony, your field is not a profession. There's no way to tell good people from bad people. So you're not yet ready or professionalized enough to have those signals and indicators to the outside world. So what is your common voice and common belief set as a security research community? Much like architects or engineers or different things have their professional signals and their professional voices, what we tend to do is we ask security vendors, and they go and give a security vendor commercially interested testimony. What we don't have is a non-commercial technical voice of reason and literacy for these kinds of things. And this is one of the opportunities we have is to prepare ourselves for at least that. So you know, what should we do? What could we do? You know, sort of you know, outlining this of where we need to go. Um, Obviously, we talked about this earlier, but the bottom, you know, sort of the underlying impact here is, is doing research, doing good targeted research to benefit the public. And that's, that's basically, you know, you know, the real core, core piece of what we're trying to talk about and what we're trying to get out there. You know, spending more time on the things that matter and less time on things that, uh, frankly, don't matter as much, you know, as far as impact to personal lives, to livelihood, to, you know, life safety issues. Also, getting out the right message. You know, when there is a medical device issue or there is a car that's been hacked, um, you know, for me, my, my personal opinion is that if there is, um, it's sort of, you know, this, you know, chain of influence. If a researcher um, is, is, finds a problem in a, in a brand name car and goes out and is able to get it to veer off the road and crash, well, that researcher going in front of, you know, going on TV, you know, you know, a major media channel um, puts him on TV and says, hey, I can, look at this, this guy can crash the car. 
that's doing actually a disservice to what we're trying to talk about, you know, trying to get the attention out there so that it's presented professionally, there are these issues, and actually following that issue along the chain so that when it does come out the media end, it's discussed rather than rather in a, in a form of less sensationalism and more about there's issues, underlying issues with these systems and this technology that need to be fixed rather than, you know, hackers can crash all your cars and, you know, it's going to be mayhem in the streets. Yeah, so um, if you do security operationally, you might be familiar with that concept of the kill chain, right? So espionage happens, there's a penetration, there's reconnaissance, there's lateral movement, there's all these different stages in the chain and you want to disrupt one to cause the, the breach not to happen. So we basically flipped that and said, what's the positive chain of influence? What's our kill chain? And what you find is, you know, God love them, but, you know, Charlie Miller, I said, well, how, what kind of recommendations did you make to the car manufacturers? I think they, they, uh, they compromised a Toyota Prius and a Ford Focus, I believe. Uh, and he said, yeah, we didn't make any. And I said, well, why not? And he said, well, they're not going to fix it anyhow. Now, I'm not judging his response. It's a common response. You know, Jay Radcliffe tried to get the FDA and his device manufacturer to listen, and they didn't. So they, they do what they're good at. They break things. They gave up. They tried. Um, but what we found is we also we have breakers, but we also have fixers. And we have good spokespeople. And we have people who work in the medical device field. And we have people who interface directly with the FDA. And we hadn't stitched together that positive chain. And we've confused activity for our node in that relay race with results. And if you look at like jailbreaking an iPhone, you can't do it in one step. There's several steps. And we need to start treating this in our personal lives and our safety and even our civil liberties just like that. And then, of course, you know, Cheney preventing you know, bad cybersecurity laws and education awareness. Obviously, if you watched um, Dave Kennedy yesterday at the, in, testifying in front of the Senate, uh, Senate committee, it was very clear. Anybody who's in this room that watches it, it's very clear there's a major disconnect from what Dave, Dave was speaking in very clear, very clear to understandable terms that you know, I, I thought was, you know, was great. He demonstrated things. And there was still a very strong disconnect between the, the folks that were sitting in the balcony or sitting in the seats. They were asking them questions. You could see that there was, the light bulbs were not going off in their head because the basic understanding of what he was talking about um, was not there. And we need, to, we need to be better at that. Yeah, and I think he did an admirable job. But, you know, it was one of the hardest things I've ever done was that TED Talk because I can't use jargon. You can't use basic concepts. There's no common denominator. So it's not a matter of they, they're ignorant and we need to make them know everything we know. Actually, it's quite the opposite. We need to really get better at what we believe and what we know, and we have to prioritize our messages. We can't give them 50 different things to do to protect themselves. We have to cull it down to the most important messages that are most accessible and start to raise that common denominator so we can build upon it. But right now, it's lacking. Um, now, this is a potentially, hopefully, less hostile audience than some of the others, but we also have some haters. Um, they think this is the worst possible idea. Uh, Space Rogue ran a discussion at B-Sides Delaware two weeks ago and got, got a beating of sorts. Not everybody hated it, but let's just take a couple of these things on. Um, there's lots of reasons it won't work, right? We're really good at breaking things. We're not really good at talking to people outside the echo chamber. Um, we don't have experience in safety engineering. All these different skills gaps, fair enough. Um, they're not going to listen to us through this really cynical, nasty attitude. You know, we have one of the most de more defeatist cu cultures. That stress and burnout study that uh, some of us did two years back um, showed that there's three indicators of stress and burnout. Uh, one's fatigue, one's cynicism, and one's uh, perceived self-efficacy. How well do you think you're doing at your job? We had one of the highest scores in the history of the Maslow Stress Index on cynicism. Right? And I'm not saying it's unmerited. It's just that we have a really self-fulfilling prophecy with what will and won't work, or that this is much bigger than us. And you know what? I, I'm concerned, and you're concerned about all of these. In fact, there's more concerns than people tend to raise. Um, we just do, know that doing nothing isn't acceptable. And because we're the, part of the Nintendo generation, we want to fail fast and iterate. So if maybe we're doing this too soon, fine. I think we're actually doing it too late. Uh, but we're going to have several failures, and this gives us the opportunity to fail and learn from that and pick ourselves back up. So somebody has to try. In general, though, the, I'd rather focus less on what we disagree on and more on what we can agree on. So typically, the disagreements come into how we execute. But I want people to like at least first get to some sort of agreement that what we're talking about is realistic and does matter. Now, you could have reasonable people disagree that, you know, well, Josh, no one's died yet from their insulin pump that we know of. There's no one's had been a car hacked. A script kitty isn't going to kill you in your Ford Focus. All these are valid and legitimate scenarios. The problem is what we're seeing is now that hacking is so easy 
and that Anonymous and others real, basically revealed to the world that hacking is a new form of power and available to anyone. And you can go on Shodan and look for industrial control systems directly connected to the internet with default usernames and passwords. You can use attack tools. You can use the Metasploit project. It's just too easy to assert your will on other people, such that any kind of real-world adversary you currently face who might strap an underwear bomb or try to do something in Times Square, those motivational structures now have a new outlet, one that's less risky and less costly, in fact. So I'm, we're not trying to spread fear, uncertainty, and doubt. It's just a matter of, okay, you know, um, what Andrea said, which was really telling, was for pollution in the U.S., it took the Cuyahoga River in Cleveland, Ohio, to catch on fire and stay on fire before there was a public discussion about, yeah, maybe we should clean up our environment a little bit. And we're probably going to face a very similar thing until she thinks the trigger point will be some kid gets run over by a self-driving car, you know. I don't know what the trigger point will be, but her point, which resonated most with me, is you can't wait for that to happen to start your, your plan. So we could argue over maybe we're doing it too soon. Fine, fine, fair, let's have that argument. But is it noteworthy that our dependence on software is growing faster than our ability to secure it? And are we depending on it in areas that can affect public safety and human life? And in, in those scenarios where, um, you know, the Cuyahoga River, obviously that's very physical. You can see the river burning on fire. But when we're talking about something like a, a self-driving car or even a car that has its ability, you know, collision avoidance, um, or you have a pacemaker or an insulin pump, when there is an accident or someone with a pacemaker dies, is there someone doing computer forensics on that pacemaker? Is there can, some, you? can you? Yeah. Is there someone doing computer forensics on the car that crashes and kills a family? Right? Is someone going to figure that out? No one's going to say it's not going to... So the person died. They have a pacemaker. They had a pacemaker because they had a heart condition anyways. And so now they died. Mm -hmm. Is it a flaw in the pacemaker? Was it an attack against that individual? Who knows? The Cuyahoga River on fire, it's very obvious. Um, and it's, and it's going to cause people to say... In those kind of situations cause people to say, yeah, we need to fix this. Well, how are we going to know mm -hmm. uh, from a society that there's flaws in these devices yeah. that need to be fixed or they, that, that, are, that are being used um, for, for, for harm? And there's a more practical reason why to start now. You know, whether or not you think any of these deaths will ever happen, whether they're malicious or not, they could simply be bugs. And there's zero software liability laws right now. So if you haven't paid attention to that, there's a, there's a great book by David Rice which kind of outlines why this is all becoming a problem and what, what combination of, of effects. It's called uh, Geekonomics, not Freakonomics. Um, and he wrote that several years back. But it's just, it's, what he was writing about it seems to be coming more and more true. But here's an economic reason to get in front of it now. When you look at the Boeing 787, or industrial control systems, the half-life of these things are 20, 30, 40 years. So design on architecture choices made now, in lieu of the recognition of an adversary or any security controls, um, they have incredibly long deployment time. So even if we just didn't know better for the industrial control system that went out last year, there's another one going out next year and the year after that and the year after that. So we can start rationing from wildly reckless conversations and decisions to somewhat less. And you can have a, a migration path. We're not looking to say, stop progress, stop technology. The very car I'm worried about hacking me, I mean, being hackable in, has really nice technology safety features, right? It's, it's risks and rewards. The question becomes, can we make more uh, efficient risk decisions if we have better visibility of the types of risks we're taking? In the medical device thing, uh, I, I skipped the bacon point, I went to Kevin Fu, who interfaces with the FDA on these things, and I said, why the heck is there Bluetooth on an insulin pump which can give you a lethal injection? It's outside your body. You can just plug a wire in it. Why the heck would they do that? Is there a medically necessary reason? And there wasn't one. I said, then why did they do it? They said, well, it's a cool advertising feature. They call it the bacon principle. Everything tastes better with bacon. Everything tastes better with Bluetooth. So that's a, as an example of elective complexity, elective attack surface, elective risk, with no reward, other than a marketing slick, there, it's, it's really a poor choice. And if we can start to inform better choices, then we're getting into that life cycle of continuous rollout of new technology. So you don't have to wait for blood in the streets for us to start making slightly more informed decisions. So there's a lot more work to do. Wanna... Yeah, I mean, wanna, you know, have you, when you saw the journey, um, we're at the point where um, we're just starting to have conversations about you know, our identity, the mission, vision, values, you know, what we're all about, um, because we want to narrow that down. We want to narrow the, and we want to have these conversations to understand, are we attacking this thing that's five miles wide? Um, scope, scope creep could kill it, right? Right, and so yeah. we want to get narrow. We want to understand, you know, wh where, are the, where, where is the best chance of success? But if we do fail, let's iterate 
and, and, and try something different rather than try 500 things at the same time and never get one inch um, down the path. Um, and of course, you know, trying to plan, trying to understand you know, where we need to go. Um, and that's where these types of conversations take place. Mm -hmm. So chapter, right. what is this, chapter four. Of um, four. I think of four. So how do you get involved? And, the, and this is the big piece here. So we have upcoming events. If anybody here is going to Microsoft Blue Hat um, in December, um, there will be a session, I think, on Friday morning for a couple of hours um, where uh, Microsoft people um, and people who, you know, who are part of um, working with the Calvary movement um, will be there as well to have discussions about this very topic. Um, and then some things January, OWASP California. I'm speaking at OWASP California on this, going to run some sessions there. Um, and then there's some question marks because we have some yep. question, we have some, we've been in discussions with some of the various conference groups. Um, RSA. Um, yeah, Shmukon, uh, she knows, uh, Heidi knows she's going to include it. She's trying to decide how big a room and for how long. Um, but, you know, this is very premature today, but I've had initial conversations at the RSA conference. Yes, it's a mainstream, very large conference, but, um, you know, we have to cast a wide net. If we can't get to the more mainstream version of our security peers, then we certainly are going to have to struggle getting outside of the echo chamber to others. So they're talking about putting us in a sandbox um, for workshops and discussion with that community. Uh, since we have a little influence over ThoughtCon and Source Boston, because we both help run them, uh, and you founded ThoughtCon, right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we're going to be doing something there as well. So what we're finding is we're not even pushing this on people. These different um, watering holes are helping us continue the dialogue and conversation. Now, it has to turn from conversation to action. Um, you know, we're about four months in from revealing it to the world, and we're about two months out from our first working group. But if we get, you know, six months out from the first working session without something concrete, you know, it may lose interest, so we're keeping it going. Uh, and the good news is at least one drumbeat a month of pretty significant folks, uh, including when I kind of conscripted the TED community. We'll see how that goes. And then, of course, leading up to next August, so that'll be a year um, at Black Hat, DEF CON, sort of, you know, B-Sides, Vegas, um, those types of sessions. We're planning, preliminarily planning something to have an adjacent session where it'll be an all-day, multi-day type working session uh, where we'll, we'll actually be able to get really, really deep into some of these topics. And these are echo chamber, just to be clear. Um, yesterday, Jay Radcliffe was invited to speak at the FTC event. So we're already finding that they had interest in engaging the security community. They just didn't know who to ask or who to go to. So we are submitting call for papers to a medical device uh, conference, to an uh, automotive work session. So we're much like, you know, Gene Kim has been a really great ambassador into the DevOps community. Jeremiah Grossman often speaks at things like Velocity or other non-security events. This is a huge chunk of this, is getting outside of the echo chamber, outside of the choir, and having accessible and compelling and prioritized messages. So we need you. And that's, you know, if you have experience with medical devices, the automotive industry, the area of focus we're targeting today, um, if you have m media expertise, if you're a member of the media, we'd love you to be part of the, part of the conversations. Um, also, you know, if you, you know, this is, you know, further down the, further down the road when we're talking about what type of organization we may form into, um, if you have lobbying or policy or not-for-profit experience, um, we can certainly use that. Um, and then, of course, organization visual skills. There's a lot of ideas that um, sometimes when, you know, folks like us or, you know, try to, try to depict the idea um, for, the, for the general population, um, things get sort of lost in translation. So if you, if you have skills that just can take ideas and, and, and understand a way you can broadcast that and explain it to, to everybody else, all the other concerned citizens yeah. out there in, in, a, in an understandable way, we can use your help as well. Yeah, some of the people that were, had the most profound value to add in the Cavalry Congress at DerbyCon were project managers, or um, they have a job in the healthcare industry, so they actually operationally run IT in healthcare at, at a hospital. Or um, one of them offered, he says, look, I have no technical skills whatsoever, but I'm really, really good at making animations. Can I make a video or a series of videos on explaining some of these concepts to your neighbors? So it's going to take a, a village to raise this child, I think. But uh, we don't have this kind of skills. In fact, I've likened this to the, the, the children's story of stone soup. You know, we don't have enough ingredients to make the tasty soup. But the more people we keep talking to and the more people we keep telling this about, to, the more skills and ingredients are being brought to the table, and it's tasting pretty damn good already. Um, so casting a very wide net, you don't have to be an elite hacksaw to contribute. If you're a citizen, you're a stakeholder. 
So let's personalize this to OWASP. We have different kind of folks that come to AppSec USA, right? Some of you are elite hack stores. Some of you are uh, operational security people. Some of you are developers. But I'm pretty sure all of you are dependent on some of these vulnerable and increasingly vulnerable technologies. So even if you don't care about this for your day job, um, you are part of the technically literate demographic that can help us uh, in one way, shape, or form. So you have a couple suggestions for each of these roles? Suggestion? Yeah, how people can get involved. Obviously, we're going to talk about a mailing list that we have. Um, and I think, how much time do we have left? We have five minutes. We have five minutes. So uh, we'll give you a link. There is a mailing list. Um, anybody is welcome. It's a public mailing list out there where a lot of these discussions are happening. Um, that's our first line of communication. Um, we also have a Twitter account. But of course, through you know, getting involved here, um, you know, if you are a community leader, if you have another organization that you're part of that maybe is even outside of the echo chamber, um, we'd love to, to talk with that community, um, talk with that organization. And if you're a blogger, a podcaster, or, you know, someone who's you know, in, in the media, if you, if you want to write about um, the things that we're talking about, we'd be happy to um, give you talking points and, and, and even, even, even talk with you. If you're a breaker, though, and you have a choice between the next 7,000th piece of Android malware or a medical device, it's not meaningless to have done the Android malware. In fact, Android as an OS is going to be in a lot of embedded systems. It's just that if you are six half a dozen of the next thing you're going to break, please break something that affects your public safety. And, and do it with us. In fact, think of this as a platform as a service for you. If you do something aligned with the Cavalry's goals and mission, you're likely to get access to media, access to force multiplication, guidance on how to interact with that particular manufacturer. There's a, one of the reasons Katie Mazuris is involved, she's a Microsoft person, but she also has helped to write the standard for ISO for disclosure. This entire bevy of consumer electronics and industrial control systems have never, ever dealt with hackers before. They've never dealt with researchers. And they're going to go through the five stages of grief, just like everyone else did. And look how long it took Microsoft to get religion on this. So we want to help you interface with them. We're even going to track which ones are most litigious, which ones have a bug bounty, which ones are going to use some sort of third party for disclosure. So if you're a breaker, please pick things that matter and leverage the resources we're trying to aggregate for you. If you're a builder, get a job at a car manufacturer. Get a job at a medical device place. Write device drivers that are less attackable. In fact, one of the hackers who was drawn to this took a job at a car manufacturer. That's his solution to this problem. If you, know, if you think about sort of the power of, you know, even the people in this room or even at this conference, you know, anybody here attend the, um, is the bug smash um, oh. that was going on last night? And so basically OWASP organized um, with, um, um, with the bug crowd and also Facebook to basically attack all the various bug bounty enabled environments last night. And so they, they spent, I think, better part maybe the day before, but all, you know, most of last night basically going out and attacking various systems. And the last I heard is that they found about 68 or 70 um, reportable vulnerabilities in all the various people out there that had bug bounty programs. So those are going to get reported. And, and, and so just think of that. That group of people is focused on those systems last night and found those vulnerabilities. Imagine what the power of the people who are doing that research could have if they were focused on um, medical devices or cars or Internet of Things. It, it would be astounding. Yeah, you know, and, and if, you're, if you're not a builder or a breaker, one of the girls at the TED Talk had an insulin pump. She came up a 20-something. She said, what can I do? And I said, ask your doctor about the security risks of your device. And she said, what will that do? I'm like, he or she may not know. Or he or she may choose a device manufacturer that's better. So regardless of your role or your, your stake in life, you are dependent upon these things, and you can start to talk about them or ask questions, which might unlock some free market forces and at least some demand. As a former product manager, when we got a, a deal loss, the same excuse for three or four in a row, it gets your attention and you start to see roadmaps pivot and change. So here's the uh, I am the Cavalry and the Google group. Um, and we know this is going to be hard. And we know this is going to take 10 years before we see our first piece of fruit. Uh, we just know it's important. And we know we need to start now. And we don't even need everyone's help. You know, I'd be thrilled if uh, the echo chamber was simply neutral towards the idea. But so far, this has legs because it actually resonates. You know, we're making it real and we're trying to take our research or our job or profession from things that matter a little bit to things that matter a lot. And this is how everything has ever changed. So, we're going to end planting the seed of 
think about starting year 2014 with doing security of consequence and realize that uh, no one's coming to save you, so it's going to be you. And with that, I think we're out of time. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.